Well, hello everybody. Here we are at the last day of Dell World, and uh, I just sat and through a uh, presentation that my coworker Matt gave, and it was going over one of a you know one of the more to topics that I like quite a bit, basically DevOps, and and you know it went at it an angle that I always appreciate, which is like there's there's a couple angles you can talk about DevOps. One of them is like oh it's cool and fun, and the other one is like the tools. But then the pragmatic one that doesn't come up a lot is like how businesses can use DevOps. Like what's the business benefit of it? And I mean, if you think that's a fair characterization, I mean, what would you say the general narrative of the presentation you were doing was? Well, the, the basis of the presentation was not so much the individual technology, DevOps or cloud or even agile development, but the process of using all three at the same time gave businesses a greater business agility. They could go faster to market, they could create returns of their product and get more product knowledge and customer interaction over any given time. And so it was less about the adoption of one or another, more about the collective use of the entire process that drove the value for the customers. And then we gave some specific examples of companies who previously either had no product or had developed a brand new product in the cloud using this methodology, the speed with which they could do it, and the business value that was driven out of it, and mainly customer delight. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I always, uh, it, one of the cases you had reminded me of how lucky we are to have National Instruments here in town, because they, time and time again, they come up as like an interesting cloud DevOps example, and, and uh, here they are, right in Austin. The interesting part about uh, National Instruments is that the company itself makes a physical product that seemingly has no relevance to the cloud and or even uh, the, the internet. They make an FPGA card, which is a sensor for things like vibration and heat and temperature and wind and so on inside physical appliances. However, what they had discovered from a time pressing issue on the client side was that they needed a better visualization of that. And they decided to do that in the cloud, adopting again the three methodologies, the agile, BizDev and the cloud properties itself, they developed a brand new capability in a very short time frame and beat their both competitors to the market and created a new capability within the company such that now all of the other groups outside of that one de department are now clamoring for that type of development for other products within their FPGA lineup, which is essentially a physical based card, but now has a very nice clean user interface by which data is aggregated and, and visualized, which is a capability not seen in, in the, their product before and or by their competitors. So and, it turned out to be a great advantage. And part of what you said, I remember in the, we had about 10, maybe 15 minutes of audience discussion afterwards, which was nice to like get everyone uh, pulled into that. And uh, I remember at one point someone was asking like how you get, how you get organizations and developers to ad adopt these pro these uh, processes and everything. And, and you were, like, like the National Instruments thing you went over touches on one of them, and it's, it's kind of like a flippant answer, but it's like, well, you succeed at it, <laughs> right? Like, like, it's sort of like, rather than forcing people to adopt this stuff, like these things, they should, be adopt they should start using them because they'll make them more successful. I Which mean, that's sort of like the common story that we hear about SaaS, right? So there was an advantage for somebody to use a certain piece of application. They got their credit card out, they used it online, they went around IT, and they just now have this new capability, and it was very easy. Same thing with virtualization in the early days. No corporate center approved virtualization, but small groups who owned servers were putting virtualizing servers and getting more power and content out of their existing systems. So it's sort of this inorganic, or this organic growth that is happening. And I think you'll see the same thing with DevOps and agility, in that it won't be a corporate function uh, although I gave one example, I'll come back to it. It was more departmental-based or product team-based or even application-based use cases where they see greater need either for the flexibility or the agility that that uh, work process flow gives you, the process of agility. The case of a corporate function, which I think is rare up to this date, would be Netflix. Netflix has more or less mandated the entire company move to a cloud-centric model and has already, because they were already web-centric and a web property, utilizing that. But you have sort of the ends of the spectrum there. You've got National Instruments in Austin, Texas, who is in no way a cloud company and doesn't even really have software as a major component of the product. For redesigning their product and making software and the capability in the cloud and the visualization there, the most powerful part about their product. And then you've got a single monolithic one product company out in California, Netflix, in which their primary 
platform is the, their business and they're having that one big product and the entire corporate functions run along this DevOps and the uh, process facility. Well, yeah, and, so and, and really kind of a spectrum there. And to your point, I mean, I, mean, I, I always reduce something like Agile, kind of, but more specifically DevOps down to uh, uh, having smaller chunks of code that you're getting out and you're putting them out more frequently, right? And I think it's, it's fun to find, see all those examples that they all, no matter what business they're in, they're kind of doing that. That's the, to me, the core of that process is like the bigger you make your gigantic software release, there's so much more overhead in, in every, every sense of whether it's risk or time that if you instead chop things down into little releases, it just seems to manage that risk a little bit better. You know, monolithic applications versus multi-tier applications also help out in that story, right? Because if you have a monolithic application, it behaves as one monolith, it fails as one monolith. And so test and dev and the QA process is very complete, thorough, and long-lasting. Whereas if you have a multi-tier application made up of multiple service elements, then you can test and release and improve those individual releases at any given time. And so the inferred within this process is sort of this you know, modularization of the code, modularization of the services, multi-tiering the aspect of the application, and then being able to turn off and on and add value to the platform without killing the whole platform if, it, if it's for some reason fails over. Now, the nice thing about in a dichotomy in this world is sort of there's a, a group of companies that won't put any code into place until it's been thoroughly tested and it's monolithic and so they tend to do code releases once a year versus the DevOps agility time frame which is push code 10, 20 times a day you can get incremental increases of productivity for your customers it's 10 times a day if you ever log into Facebook and you find out it looks different and it's got a new feature and your friends all of a sudden have some neat old cool button on it that's a, a, an example of that, where the code is pushed on a more frequent basis and you're not waiting for a once every year release where Facebook magically updates everything. Yeah, and so I, it's I, an agility capability that per, allows yeah. you to compete more effectively. And it plays off, I think, that base human desire of liking new stuff, <laughs> right? Like, like, no matter what the product is, like if almost to, to a certain, I'm sure there's exceptions, but for the most part, whatever sort of thing you're consuming, if there's some newness to it, like I feel like that keeps people engaged and involved, right? Like even even perhaps the thing that has the least newness to it ever, soap operas. They have you know, they kind of repeat the same plots and dynamics over and over again. But you know, there's new episodes every day to keep you involved. They get married to different people. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And different people get thrown over a cliff and yeah. then come back to life. Yeah, exactly. Which is that's basically DevOps, right? Throwing people <laughs> <laughs> So that that snide joking aside. So like what what we talked a little bit about what the audience was talking about like in the Q and A session, but like what what how would you, how would you characterize the reaction that people seem to have to what you're talking? And 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 so who was the audience you were giving it to first to give context? Well, the audience was a group of CTOs who all of whom already use Dell as an OEM, so they write the code and they write their product independent of Dell, and then Dell actually handles some of the go to market functionality around loading that onto a piece of software. Or, I'm sorry, a piece of hardware and shipping that to a client. So we become the hardware provider in that instance. Um, so there are basically companies who make some physical base appliance and then add, add value to it through their code. We make the physical part and then they deliver that. The questions I think were pretty interesting and ranged from the experience of the audience. A lot of people were wondering how can, if you own 45 data centers today, how do you magically go to this? It's, it's very hard. And you know there was kind of some trying to get their hands around how do I operate a business in a DevOps cloud environment? Where are my IT guys and what do they monitor? And it was sort of that, hey, you don't own data centers in the cloud. In this model, you just don't own the infrastructure. So there's no need to do that. So how do you monitor it? Well, you, you put instruction into the code. So we had a fairly long discussion around what does it take to instrument the code or instrument your application at the time you develop it. And that was really a mandate or a requirement of the developers. And we had some conversation about the coders up until maybe five years ago had no such need or interest in instrumenting their application, so they didn't. It was all handled by IT operations. QA wasn't cool in QA the past. Wasn't cool. Now you have a whole uh, generation of programmers who are taught to care about all the elements supporting the application, the databases, the services, and so on. And so this group of people also knows about instrumentation of applications. And it was how do you get your internal 
developer pool to actually take on this task of understanding the application and instrumenting it and making it able to be managed in a DevOps way. So if there isn't an IT ops organization and there isn't, you don't own the infrastructure, so you don't have the teams to do that. You're actually running in the cloud. You need to monitor your application at that level. And largely it was through instrumentation of the application itself or through monitoring tools such as New Relic, which is uh, very popular in the Ruby community and the online community. Right, right. And, and then there was an interesting discussion of, uh, I always like the, uh, I guess you call it sovereign data issue discussion. Because it's funny, it, 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 it like always unmasks, or it, it doesn't unmask, it always discovers sort of unintended consequences of like regulations and laws that like you probably wouldn't really imagine. Like, and, and so I mean, can you summarize the, yeah, to, the sort of discussion that was there? To summarize the issue, the sovereign issue is actually a country issue. So a particular country has a, either rules or regulations around data or security or uh, the storage of its own data or of employee privacy data, uh, privacy rights for its, its uh, population. In that instance, each sovereign entity or country can have their own regulations. Now that's at a country level. Add on top of that that you have healthcare verticals with healthcare regulations and financial verticals with financial regulations. It becomes a very complex mess if you want to be a worldwide provider of your application or product to people. And so we had a, a discussion about how can you operate in the cloud, have an application in the cloud like National Instruments or like Netflix, and meet all of the compliance across these regions. And it became a very, you know, it's a very interesting task. And, and at Dell, we've looked at that, and we've looked at it for our healthcare business, learning how can we actually compete and what would it take to do so. Uh, and some discussion about whether or not that would be interesting to others to learn from that study and information. And so we, we uh, looked at continuing that conversation at a later time. Well, on that note, uh, thanks for giving us the summary. That's great. Thank you. We'll see everyone next time.